Council. This is a special meeting. Mr. Metric, will you call the roll? Uh, Mr. Wegbrecht? Here. Mr. Weissford? Here. Mr. Diaz is absent this evening. Uh, Mr. Celia? Present. Uh, Mr. Muir? Present. Ms. Tedla Moffitt is absent at the moment. And uh, Mr. Quinn? Uh, Councilor Cilio, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, tonight's council special meeting to include, to include as the first uh, item. Put, put it the hand down the bottom. Put down here. Okay. Public comment. Ah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, to include uh, the following. Uh, after the Pledge of Allegiance, a discussion by, led by the Building and Zoning Committee, followed by public comment followed by what is the first item in the printed agenda, the motion to appoint Sean Metric uh, as additional borough zoning officer, and the other items on the printed agenda. Second. I second. Any discussion on the motion to amend the agenda as described? I do think it should be noted for formally the, the motion as read has also been amended. Uh, it's not just some of the purposes as uh, acting manager, uh, uh, borough secretary, county secretary, uh, and official signatory uh, for the borough. Do you accept that suggestion? I accept that friendly amendment to the motion to amend Also, I second that. Okay, and I will have uh, Mr. Walker write that out to the notes so that it can go into the notes. I think I have a borough officer. Acting manager, borough, acting borough manager, secretary. Yeah, I believe we do have a revised resolution. Uh, all in favor of accepting the uh, amended agenda? Aye. Aye. I think 
can make it separately or put together. It's really up to whatever council preferences to do. It's all yeah. together on the basis. Yeah. Well, just, just to put it in a nutshell, since we have so many folks from the public here listening in, I think it'd be good just to recap uh, that there are a few offices that we need by borough code to have option by. John, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think there, there does need to be a manager, a treasurer, and a secretary. Correct. And Mr. Martin is currently the manager. Uh, I believe this council has appointed uh, Mr. Metric to be the manager uh, after Mr. Martin's last day, which is at the end of the year. And clearly, between now and that time, there's plenty of business that needs to be done, whether it be duties of a zoning officer or duties of secretary for the council or some sort of managerial duties. Uh, and it would be cleanest since Mr. Martin would be uh, taking the county vacation days uh, between now and that time. Uh, so we have someone in the office that has that power to not slow up the process uh, of government. Right. So, so just to recap, Mr. Martin, until the end of the year, is the borough manager, at which point Mr. Metric will assume that post. Leslie Marshall is the treasurer, will continue to be the treasurer. Um, there's a borough secretary who's required to take minutes and, and uh, deal with ordinances and so forth. And that's something where you need to have, if we also need to have somebody who, in the office available to sign checks in the meantime. Um, and then the borough zoning officer is the person, I guess it's related to the meeting building and zoning that's coming up, who's responsible for the execution of and management of our outside reviewer, but execution of uh, zoning review. Um, and so in the month that's left in the year, with Mr. Martin on vacation, he, he's that, he has that role as well right now. So that, it's the ones that he's on vacation for, other than borough manager that we're looking to have Sean fill in on uh, until the end of the year. Any further discussion? All right, let's close this matter and then go to public comment. Um, if anyone would like to address council, <clears throat> uh, and I'll start in the front, kind of work my way back, uh, ask you on this issue. On this issue, uh, I'd like you to uh, state your name and uh, your address for the record. Okay, seeing none, we will move on to the next agenda item. Yes, so someone needs to make a motion. Uh, I'm a council members and members of the building, um, members, I'll make this as a member of the borough council. Excuse me. As a member of the borough council, if you want to be present, I present the following motion for consideration. The members of the borough council appoint Sean Metric to serve as acting manager, council secretary, and officer, and authorize borough signatory in the manager's place, effective immediately. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's happening. Let the record show that Mr. Diaz arrived um, and Ms. Tepper Moffitt has arrived. I will sign this. Uh, are there any other matters? Before council. Hearing none, I'll accept the motion for adjournment. And we'll adjourn this council. I'll second. All in favor?
to have Mr. Walco here with us tonight, as well as Mr. Metric, who will be walking us through the amendments that have been made recently to this, our old friend, the Zoning Ordinance 984, which is the Conditional Use Ordinance, um, that will allow the adaptive reuse of specific institutional buildings within the borough. Um, we had a, a public meeting that kind of a, uh, it wasn't properly advertised, but it did give many residents of the world an opportunity to be heard on the issue of the adaptive reuse, specifically the Elmwood Avenue adaptive reuse. And we heard many comments, uh, useful feedback about concerns about the impact of traffic and the intensity of use that might be added to might be added to the uh, church building if, if this ordinance were allow, or is allowed. Um, so I'm just wondering if Mr. Metric or Mr. Walker would prepare to walk us through the specific changes and explain to us um, where we are. Uh, for the US and I, I guess I want to say that there were three areas that stood out during the public hearing. Um, one area was the there was a distinct objection to any use on that site other than residential. Um, there was a, a distinct expression of concern about the adding any cars to the <coughs> to the two hour zones. Um, and there was a concern about um, the building being used for any other use other than residential. Um, we hope that, the, that these amendments actually respond to the concerns that the office use be defined very specifically and tightly so that it can't ever become something more than just a very simple time office. And that the, that the parking, the intensity of the parking cannot that there cannot be any parking in the neighborhoods that currently have two-hour parking spaces, so that the property owner would be required to put all of the parking on site, or people visiting that site would have to find parking elsewhere beyond the two-hour parking zones. So please take this. Take this. Mm -hmm. and, and Again, this May still I, has can I stop you just for a second? Sure. John, does, does anybody, can anyone come tonight who wanted a paper copy of the ordinance who doesn't have one? I have a few extra. I didn't make a ton of them, but. Thank you. Do you want one too? Yeah. <laughs> now, this revised ordinance obviously has gone through a lot of review um, already uh, prior to the, the more recent additions. We took some feedback from the initial planning commission where you added some language, uh, particularly uh, a small change in subsection B, A1, where we want to specify this is for the protection of existing design integrity, such that we added for existing. I, I believe there will likely be additional non-substantive changes that will clarify sort of the, the process for protecting the covenants and not specific office use that will come. Uh, and again, I, I believe those will be uh, discussed more at a planning commission meeting. And again, I don't think there will be substantive changes. Uh, so I, I don't believe it's necessary to come back and eat on, on what the planning commission members have been recommending to be made. Um, additional substantive changes made under BA1, uh, subsections, uh, I believe H through K, but I could be wrong, were, were, were added. Again, providing more specific protections to the design integrity of the buildings, and again, uh, providing further clarification about Borough Council's right to enforce uh, the conditions that they would put during a condition of use order if one was approved uh, to maintain the design integrity of the building. And these are these are things that would likely happen in the covenants, anyways. Uh, but as a abundance of caution, we'd like to have the ordinance as well. The, the largest changes, and I believe the changes that were most desired by council based upon the feedback um, from the 
borough citizens was the definition of office use to be added to specifically uh, pertain to this use. And this should be made known that this is a definition that is only for this ordinance. This only pertains to this section, not the zoning section in general. Um, and we've limited the amount of office use to business office uses, and I'll just read it, including uses that involve administrative, clerical, real estate, financial, governmental, certain professional operations, and operations of a similar character. The following uses are specifically excluded from the definition office use for purposes of this section and shall not be permitted. They are as follows. Medical and dental, that should be offices, not officers. That's why we're here. Uh, <laughs> clinics, laboratories, retail, child care, industrial, temporary lodging, photographic studios and or television or radio broadcasting studios, personal service or therapeutic uses including psychological or psychiatric uses. This definition was set up in a way where if council or uh, committees had specific concerns of a particular type of a use, we could add that as a particular exclusion <coughs> under this ordinance. I believe the idea was to try to prevent those types of uses that generate a lot of um, visitors or turnover. Uh, and the idea is that it's more of a professional or administrative office like you know, an accountant. Or, uh, or a real estate agent, somewhere where there aren't people coming and going every 15 minutes. Um, and those are some of the specific uses that we wanted to preclude just so that there was no um, gray area in those regards. So in addition to addressing the definition of office use, uh, we needed to address the issues that the public brought up regarding parking. One of those issues is still to be discussed and resolved. And as you can see, that's located under subsection D. So this is B3D, where it says the proposed use shall provide XX percent percent of the minimum off-street parking required in section 124.55.2, which is the uh, provision that addresses the requirements for off-street parking throughout the borough under the current code. Um, what that XX percent should be is something that council should should decide and needs to decide. And I believe Mr. Mentor will be able to provide more information on that based upon his background as, as a planner um, and how we came to, to those decisions. Uh, that's regarding off-street parking and what any developer will need to provide on site in order to gain approval. If you don't meet that percentage, it doesn't even get to the conditional use aspect because that is an objective condition that you either can or cannot meet. The second provision that was added to address parking problems was the idea of, well, let's address off-street parking. And that's what subsection D was aimed to do. Um, right now, under the borough code, there is a, a, a almost by right to have parking in front of your residence um, where you could go pay your dollar and get particularly for residential, as many parking um, as many parking passes as you would like. Uh, I believe that's capped at office space uses uh, based upon the street frontage. You can receive a certain amount of parking spaces. Um, we are trying to take action to prevent parking um, in the immediate front of areas, and by that I mean it would really, this provision would give it to council the right to say, we don't believe that parking in front of this development is appropriate for this area. So the provisions that otherwise would apply don't apply in this situation. However, we as council, as part of the condition of use process, can find areas based upon our knowledge uh, and working with staff of the borough to say, you can park in these areas. Uh, maybe perhaps because there is available parking there or the parking concerns aren't as much. So uh, that is particularly for the, the office use. Uh, as far as the residential use, I believe it limits stick it, uh, the parking permits to one parking permit per residential unit. Uh, and again, right now under the code, it's you know, as many permits as they would like to have for residential 
uh, but for employees or anyone that's there for the office use, we try to define it broadly. Um, you can say, no, you can't park in front of your building that you otherwise would be entitled to. Uh, however, based upon our observations, we need you to park in this district and create a specific parking district or, or area that you can permit them to park in. When would that be decided? That would have to be something that's decided through the conditional use hearing. And um, you don't have to <laughs> provide it, but uh, that would be something uh, that this council would have to, have to do and have to find. Uh, and hopefully we'd be able to find areas that, that would work um, as part of the conditions process. Um, so those are, are really the, the, the two biggest changes. Obviously, there is that percentage that needs to be discussed. We did want to make it more clear that all of these conditions uh, of the conditional use standards and criteria that are listed under the code must be met, as well as the community development objectives. So we cleaned up the language in subsection H to meet that. So really, um, this still permits office use. Um, the office use is defined and is limited. Uh, and it uh, attempts to control the parking issues by giving council the right to require a certain amount of off-street parking facilities. Um, and is that, that's based upon square footage under the code. And also, if there is any overflow parking, saying, well, that overflow parking can't be in front of the building, you have to go to the area you were later designated. Everything else essentially remains the same. This did entail some changes that needed to be made uh, to make this make sense with the parking requirements. Sean, did you have anything you want to add? Well, I can talk to the off-street parking variable that's in the code tonight, if, if you guys are ready to hear about that, or if you have something, that, another direction you want to take the conversation in now. Let's hear that first. I think I wanted to discuss parking and kind of the differences residential parking and office parking. So it may be helpful to hear what you have to say first. Let's have some information. Okay, well, the existing Narvik code requires two off-street parking spaces for every residential unit. It also requires uh, one off-street parking space for every uh, 200 square feet of office. 200 square feet of office. And the, the approach to calculating off-street parking that was in this ordinance the last time we saw it that, the, uh, that had been proposed was to calculate the amount of off-street parking that the existing non-conforming use would require and then have the new use supply a quotient or a portion of that use. When I looked into Narva's existing code, I found it very difficult to calculate how many parking spaces a church should have. I ended up spending time looking at websites that discuss the difference between you being able to fit six people in a pew as opposed to ten people in a pew, because people don't like to sit that close together in church, I guess. So I thought it was just a really slippery number to try and calculate, and since the code really, what we really want to get at is how, how much off-street parking do we want the use that's going to be there to provide, I thought it made more sense to just have applicants meet the demand that their use is going to generate. Now, why are we contemplating less of a percentage than 100%? It's because we've concluded, going through the form-based code and then looking at our codes, that the parking requirements in Narvik are really pretty high. They're really similar to communities like Hatfield Township or Upper Providence Township, in that you have a standard for retail in the in the or, in the ordinance today that has, for instance, um, I know it, it works out to one parking space per about 165 square feet of retail. I think it's six per thousand is the number in the code. And this, these kinds of off street parking standards correlate to a development pattern that doesn't look anything like Narva. If you wanted to rebuild Narva's downtown, according to these non-residential parking standards, it would be unrecognizable. So, 
comfortable with recommending to council that you, a, a percentage of what the current code requires is a good approach because that's what we've concluded through our work with the form based code and that's where we're headed. Off street parking requirements are always a proxy for the intensity or density of a use of a property. You know, in downtown Philadelphia, you can develop and not provide any off street parking because that's the, the urban pattern down there. It makes sense. There's a neighborhood resource of parking that businesses and residents draw upon. That doesn't work, make much sense for Narvis community. In other places in the county, um, off street parking standards are planning for the, the hundred year storm of parking. You know, every Walmart parking lot has. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of parking space, and that doesn't accord with Narberth's uh, pattern of land use and design. So it's, it's clearly we're, we're somewhere in the middle, and this is an attempt to, to, to the form base code attempted to sort of think that through, which is why we came up with some numbers in that document that uh, are a little bit lower than what's in the existing code. So I'm comfortable with recommending that you explore a number less than 100%. But that number is going to dictate how much and how intensely the property can be used. If that number is a high percentage, then that property is not going to be able to meet that high standard of parking, and there will be less that can go into the building. If you choose a lower number, there's more than, that could possibly go into the building, because we've seen sketch plans of the Baptist Church, and there's room for 10 or 11 parking spaces seven or eight if you preclude parking in the front yard setback area. So we know how many spaces can kind of fit on the site. So it's just up to, there's, there's a balancing act here to, to say how, how intensely the property can be used and where you should set that percentage. In subsection D, the, the on-street works with subsection D together. So obviously if you can't park on the premises, you then have to park off the premises. And where can you park? That's when subsection G comes along and says we can dictate where you can park off premises parking. It's also, I think, noteworthy that the idea uh, of subsection B that these buildings be located within public transportation is to try to encourage people to not be driving. Um, and that that is one, I believe, Sean, one of the uh, reasons why you recommend something less than 100 percent yeah. that condition as well. Not to mention the way. Council members, when I just think about the use, um, residential use, I think of that as a kind of 100% of the time use. We, we, most of us live and operate in our homes 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And we need to park most of the time. We need some place to park. And I think what I like about the requirement that there be some on-site parking is that it be available to for the residential use because they're the people who would be there all weekend, you know, all 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 the evening, all night. And they're so they they will have a place to put their cars off the street at night. Um, the, you see a lot of office people come and go in different parts of the borough. I live, I see people come for yoga classes once an hour, sometimes up to 60 people, only for a one or two hour yoga class. And those cars are sort of absorbed into the neighborhood where people can park, um, can park for short duration or without the two hour limit. If, if there's an office use such as this that doesn't have frequent visitors, it's sort of more like a banking hours kind of parking where they're coming at 9 or 10 in the morning, leaving at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, they're needing long-term parking so they won't be able to park in any two-hour zones. They would have to seek parking in a municipal lot or on a street that has an unregulated, unregulated parking. And that just seems to make sense to me. Not having, none of us have actually seen the I've ever seen a proposed scheme for to cover that, but 
Well, we, we, we limit it. I mean, we, are you saying that we can require only the on-site parking to be residential parking? Yeah, I mean, that's a super Give them spots to resident. We're saying there's no resident, but there's not going to be any impact to the neighboring street. Well, and then these people move into the apartments in there, and we're told by either the landlord or market conditions that if you want the parking, you have sure. to pay hundred or the amount. Well, we we reviewed this in in light of what's under the current ordinance, and under the current ordinance, if you wanted to just make that all residential, you could fill your on street parking requirements, uh, but then the resident residents could have as many parking permits as they have vehicles, and there's no caps to that. And they could do that right now under the current ordinance and clear out that entire corner with their with their cautious. This one says no. I'm trying to find something to to give credence to the residents that are there, I and mean, these are these people would be Norfolk residents saying. You don't have the same rights as everybody else to get five permits if you have five cars. You can only have one. And if you get your on-street parking, uh, or sorry, off-street parking space if that's open, great. But the residents are only getting one permit. Re residents are only getting one permit under this. Okay. Uh, so, 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 it, so it caps it. Okay. However, those residents would still be able to to park no, in front. They're only getting one per unit. That's one per unit. That serves that question really. That's right. what I'm talking about a lot of units. Yeah, okay, that's all. I mean, I, that was the question. The second question is more theoretical because we know how many two hour zones we have. And, um, you know, some of them are needed, some of them are not needed. <coughs> neighbors like them. But we have a history of, you know, if neighbors come in with a significant amount of neighbors that want a two hour zone, we give that to them. So, you know, ideally, you know, we've been talking, we'd like to figure out a thorough-wide parking, which we're not that close to at this point. Um, I just, you know, want to say what happens if the four or five blocks nearby move to two-hour, you know, request two-hour zones, and you've got 25 to 50 new cars from this office complex, you know, is there We've got some rough ideas of parking here, and there's different counts, and not really a strong determination of what is proper. Is it 80 percent parked? Is it 100 percent? Is it 50 percent? What works in these narrow streets? Because you've got yield traffic and such. Um, I don't know if it, you know this takes into account. If somebody goes, I hate to see, and build this this complex, spend all this money, and then. People start parking on one block because that's the closest. Those neighbors come in, and you know we continue to see that. And now we've got a situation where um, he's developed a wonderful building. He's invested all this money, and it's the people that are going to work there to use right, have to go park in Lower Marion, which is probably more restrictive than all of So, I mean, is there? Well, the municipality's planning code is in its wisdom has given us a plan. The planning commission, mm -hmm. and it's their job on at our request to sort of probe down into that <coughs> question and to establish is there adequate parking. And I think they have, they've, I know that some preliminary numbers have been gathered. There's been a census at a better time of year than the summer, which is in October. An October census, I think there's census done all through the month of October, and we're gonna, we won't do this unless there's adequate parking. We, I mean, I don't, we, that would just not make sense. And I, I think but, but we, let's, have the, let's have the planning commission do it. Since they're the ones who've been actually entertained by the specific proposal, we haven't. We don't know what the, what the details of that. I guess, leading off of Bob's question, if you're going to develop a building or you know, live in a neighborhood for 50 years, you want to know Sense of some sense of security that tomorrow is going to be kind of like today, and that cat and mouse game of mm -hmm. parking goes here, and then we and then we restrict it, and then is there a limit to what we can restrict? We can't can't pass an ordinance like this permit a use and then take away all 
you know, make everything a two-hour zone, and then it's like, ha ha. Well, it's not a ha ha. It's a, you know, just as he wants a security, I would right. imagine a there's that balance. The neighbors probably look to that same security. Right, and I wouldn't want to, to handcuff either side completely, so that. I mean, I, I think it's, it's it's fair to say that there has to be reasonable parking accommodations that would be made. I mean, the, the conditions that would be put on the conditional use order would say could say you are going to park between this was permitted between this street and this street unless other reasonable accommodations could be made. It would then be up to council to go back uh, under that order to talk to the developer if there was a desire to make that to our part. And there's other reasonable accommodations that could be made, um, as long as they're okay with that. Uh, and if they're not, then, yeah, it is going to be a dispute. Um, but this is, this clearly is set up under an assumption that there are reasonable parking accommodations that could be, could be made. Uh, that are available. And, and you're this saying the planning commission does that now. They do that houses, and this business wouldn't be unique. <coughs> there are businesses all throughout the borough that would, where we would have to find parking, appropriate parking for the business owners and their employees if we were to create a comprehensive parking scheme. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. That would have to be done. So let's get back to the percentage then. We're going to put something forward in December to the council. You know, how do we come up with a percentage of you know, requirement that makes sense? What would your recommendation? I mean, to start though, Sean, I mean, under the form zoning code for every park, that number would be 50%. Is that correct? That's a good ballpark, yeah. So, I mean, 50% as the form zoning code passes is sort of. The, the threshold right there. Um, whether there should be anything less than 50% uh, because of the, the restrictions on the on-street parking and the requirement that it be made close to a public transportation, uh, <coughs> that would be what would be provided to see if you want to come down. I guess, I guess I'd like to do a planning commission here. I'd also like to be sure about that percentage, whatever that percentage is, that it accommodates 100% of the residential parking. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you can consider not issuing very much of that. As, 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 as even more restrictive, um, if you say, let's, let's park 100% of the residences on the set and not provide permits at this time. I mean, perhaps in a future scheme where if we create a Future permitting scheme where the permits, where the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth permit that the resident wants has a greater value, has an escalating value, then maybe you would offer a permit at an escalating value. But, but in the short term, restrict them to parking on the site and maybe choose a percentage that requires that all the residential parking can be accommodated on the site. So, how many spots would so we, don't, we have not been presented with a scheme, so we don't know. We, we, we really, I would suggest that we have a planning commission suggest a number to us recommend the number. We can go to that night and have be in the discussion, but I can see, but I think, you know, the, 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 it's not even the property owner hasn't even made a presentation to us, so we don't have any basis for the discussion. Okay. Other than our visits to the I don't know how we can decide to ask questions about this. There's nothing we can, you know, until we have a scheme, we're going to have to wait until next month's meeting, I guess, to recommend it. I'm just trying to move this. I, I, I think you're right. Yeah, you're right. Sure. I don't yeah. think we can. Okay. Yeah, I don't well, think then we can. I'm fine with not, getting, not coming up with answers or, okay. until if we're not planning on recommending this in the December council meetings. Yeah. 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 Well, we might, we'll see what the we might introduce it. It depends, it depends where we are. Well, if we're going to introduce, if we're thinking, if we, I want, I want the committee in front of the public to discuss these things before we introduce it to council, because yeah, they come to our meetings. Well, we'll have a committee meeting on the first Monday of December, which precedes the caucus meeting. So we'll, the caucus meeting is what, on the 6th? Yes. 
Is that correct? No, that's the Sunday. It's going to be on the 9th. The 9th. So, the, so the community meeting will take place on <coughs> Monday the 7th. So we will have an opportunity to discuss so you'll what have the an opportunity plan. To speak to the Planning Commission, cycle back around, Come back to the and then have another committee meeting on December 7th. And then we can decide at that time. I'm out of that thing. You can fill it in. That doesn't work. What, um, what time? Uh, 7. So I do want to ask, uh, how many? Yeah, it's my son's birthday. So. You can make a mark. Yeah. I can um, make arrangements. So let's look at the calendar. We'll, we'll, when we schedule it, we'll make sure it's advertised and publicized. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, so, no, I'll hold up this video. Um, I just framed it. <laughs> yeah, that's how he wants to spend it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how I spend my 18th birthday. Um, anyhow, so that's it. I still think that I, can, I just want to get a quick sense that 50% of, we have an idea of the square foot. So we want to just, decide, and we're not going to come up with a standard 50%. I just want to know what number of cars we're working from at the 50% mark based on 5,000 square feet. One space per. 500 square feet, roughly. So they would need roughly 10, 10 spaces, and that and the frontage wouldn't be captured in this, so they'd have to find 10, if it was a 50%, they'd have to find 10 spaces in, on surface, which we're certainly not going to to do. So, okay, that's, I'm not sure where you make. So I, worked, I tried to figure out, let's compare, I want to compare my numbers with yours. I tried to figure out what the grandfathered uh, church Parking would have been. And, I had no and idea. So, and I out. saw that there were two numbers. There was okay. one where was the, the space of the pews, and then there was one parking space for every ten seat within the pews. And then I noticed there was a second number, which was all the other space of the church, not the sanctuary space, like the offices, the basketball court, the classrooms, whatever else is there, was one space per hundred square feet. So. So I figured that just for the extra spaces, probably 50 parking spaces for the 5,000 ancillary spaces. And then if there were, say, 20 pews, conservatively, let's say there were 20 pews there, that would be 20 parking spaces. So the total would be 70. So is he going to be putting in the No, no, I'm saying that that's the grandfather. That's the grandfather trick. Yeah. So no, you, no, you tried to make that know. calculation. You came I was just trying to make the calculation of what the grandfathered <coughs> church <coughs> parking <coughs> was. <laughs> Trust me, I've been down that road. Is that the same thing? He wants to put a church in there. I, 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 I trust you looked at it. I, I didn't look at it in depth because I stopped when I couldn't figure out how many pews fit in the space. I, I, even if there were no pews, it would be 50. Anyway. We don't know, we don't have a way to figure out what the proposed Yeah, but we know it's not the church. It depends on, you know, if they sold it and people want to buy it and use the church. That's right. So, anyway, maybe it's in the end here. Well, why don't, I, I don't know if we need a motion to direct the planning commission to, to take it from here. Public comment is not an official part of a committee meeting, but since there's many of you here, and I imagine some people may have something to say, we're happy to um, listen. We have a, some of us have some place to go, so if you could keep your remarks brief, um, you'll have another opportunity um, at the caucus, at the council, at the building and zoning meeting on the 7th. And Planning Commission meeting tomorrow night, and there's a caucus on the night, so this is, it's not the only opportunity you have. If you would like to speak, please give your name and address and make your comment. I'll start. 
Carolyn and Scanlon, Savon Avenue. Now, is this comment that we are going to be speaking about just in regards to parking for the churches and for the office buildings? All right. So my comment is this, is if with the grandfather building, corner of our street has an office building. They have a parking lot. They also have 13 parking permits on our street. And basically, that office building owns our street, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., five days a week. And say mine. Okay, now, yes, I have a driveway, and we keep our boat in our driveway, and we keep the driveway open during the day because my husband is a plumber, and he comes in and out all during the day. So I may park in the parking lot. I may park down in front of the neighbor's house. I mean, this it is an issue when you're talking about 50% of the planned parking in any new building. And my question is, is the ordinance going to be changing to the existing buildings? Because I was, rumor has it that uh, parking permits are going to be given to neighbors that have driveways, one parking permit per household. So is that a yay or a nay? I mean, that was a, that's one reason why I came is because that was uh, mentioned to me that, oh, you have a driveway. <laughs> And no one's ever that. no one's ever discussed limiting the number of parking permits that would be available for, for residents. residents. But and it's only really in the context of this ordinance did we did we talk about not allowing an office use any permits at all. Only in the gotcha. context of this. And the reason is so that the people who would be working at that office couldn't own the street. Well, and that's a problem on our street. Yeah. And I would like to know, you know, can we get that changed? Because this this particular office building has its own dedicated parking lot that they don't use. They say they use it for their clients who come and go. And they also can park in that nice big parking lot, which is over 50% empty, the old school parking lot. And they choose, they get all these resident permits, so they say, heck, why should we park, walk 10 extra steps or you know, up and down? And the gate is open. I've pointed it out to the office people. They're like, oh yeah, how about that? And they still park. <laughs> Of our houses, <laughs> and I mean, literally, they have 13 spaces, and they own our block every single day. So that's my comment as to parking is, is tough, and I totally understand progress is great, but the residents, I think, need to take precedent over office workers. Thank you. Yeah, Robin Bernholz, Marion Avenue. So this is the south side of Narberth, and there are four blocks and one side of Rockland Avenue, which has no parking. Um, the first three streets closest to the train station um, are restricted. Marion Avenue isn't. Marion Avenue already really feels the weight of, of commuters, you know, train commuters who park there. And, you know, it's, there's not that much space. And I'm on the 200 block. The 100 block is very dense. People have more cars than they used to when, this, when you know, the current zone was developed. And that stood for the church also. In the last uh, 25 years that I've been here, when the church, the church existed, there were nine members. And they had had the right to park in um, SEPTA's parking lot on Sunday. So I wonder what happens when, you know, there's, there's nowhere else for it to move, really. So if residents on Marion Avenue say, enough, you know, we need to park on our street, then what? You know, then where do people go? There's no place else. So that's um, one concern. Another is a question, which is, what's different about, say, an accounting office that might have clients coming every half hour or something, and psychological services where there might be one appointment an hour? I, I don't understand how that distinction's made, and wonder if anyone can speak to that. additional uses. Again, that's why the B3 precluded, which is why we drafted this in a way that we could just add accounting onto that. That's something that council also felt had a high use. I, I think the sense was, quite frankly, that, that it doesn't have as much of a, of a turnaround in patients. Um, that could be wrong. Uh, uh, but right. 
right. I, I mean, do, I, I think do. it has to be stated not just what type of business, but what type of usage, right. how many people would be coming. Yeah, right. Otherwise, it's very arbitrary. Right now, it does say administrative, clerical, real estate, financial, governmental, and certain professional operations. I mean, that's the general sense. So if I'm coming in there as a tenant, I'm going to try to list my use into one of those broader uses. If the council disagrees that you're not administrative, then uh, that's going to be a dispute that would need to be hashed out. In order to get around that dispute for certain uses, that's why we specifically listed some of those uses that we thought were, would be particularly troublesome. But again, I think the public feedback period is, hey, if you have more uses on that, you would like to run by council to see whether it should be specifically added to that list. And that, that's, I think that's it's the more that it should be based on what, a, you know, that there should be numbers attached to it and not just what type of business. Okay. Uh, and I, and I also hear you saying that it's really important. I think you're making a, point, a good point about the expectation that it's really an employee workspace only. It's not a workspace that has any customers or visitors coming from the outside. It's definitely an employee workspace. So I think so. anything that's not, I mean, I'm for all residential without a doubt, but, you know, in this discussion, I just feel like that has to be really considered. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Jim Herring from uh, Chestnut Avenue. And uh, we've had canvassing of the people who live in South Margaret and uh, the overwhelming result of the canvassing was that the people did not want commercial things in South Margaret. And it was the vast majority, I just saw the gal back here have a much better figure of the number, but it was very clear that the people that live in South Norwood do not want commercial things in South Norwood. And uh, I think that was very crystal clear, and I don't understand why it appears that people just keep right on going on as though commercial is just fine in South Norwood. It's not, according to the people that live there. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm Chris Calvert. I'm 161 Marion Avenue. And I just want to reiterate um, what's already been said. I, my house is on a corner. The front is two-hour parking. The other uh, Marion Avenue is not two-hour parking. I get up in the morning. I watch everybody from the train come park their cars all up and down that street leave their cars for at least the whole day, often for the weekend if they go to 30th Street and they're going away. The streets that don't have two-hour parking are full. I don't understand where you're going to find these spaces. I, don't, I just don't get that. Unless you go, I don't know, across Bowman Avenue. If you walk, if you walk through South Narberth, you'll see that all those streets are full. Where are they going to find another 10 to 15 spaces? I don't get it. Thank you. Any more thoughts? Pamela Sanker um, from Woodside Ave. I just have a question, um, and I was trying to look at the original version of the amendment, but is it typical to have the um, enforcement of a zoning uh, statement in, embodied in the borough council as opposed to the uh, for a manager or somebody who knows the zoning laws, who's, that is their job. Sure. The, so this this really deals with a conditional use. So what would happen at a conditional use hearing is there would be a conditional use order that would be issued, almost like a judicial order, but it's a legislative order from this body. To enforce the conditional use provisions that this council puts on, that is not an appropriate enforcement through the zoning office. That would be something that this council would need to enforce uh, 
uh, and I would recommend uh, doing it through filing injunctions in the Board of Common Pleas if they felt that that order was being violated as a violation of, of an order, just like it was in the report. <coughs> um, so any aspects related to the conditional use provisions that were would be installed, or uh, there are requirements that certain conditions be placed in um, covenants or uh, association agreements that would go in that normally council wouldn't have any standing to challenge because they're not the landowner, they're not someone that's, that's living there. This gives them the right to uh, intercede in those matters to enforce those covenants that have to be put in. So in those aspects, that would be enforced by council as opposed to if they're building a building and uh, they, they don't have the amount of impervious coverage or they exceed the, uh, or they don't meet parking requirements and there are actual zoning code issues that were violated that are in the zoning code, those would be enforced by the zoning office. Um, so if it falls under the zoning code and a zoning violation, which still comes into play, and that's the zoning officer. If it's a violation of the condition council imposes, uh, that would be enforced by council. And, and that's, there was a recommendation, quite frankly, from the planning commission that if you put on a zoning officer, uh, I don't think that's proper. It may not actually be legal. Uh, and I believe it would be quicker for council to just file an injunction when they see that something is being done that shouldn't be done to enforce that order uh, than it would be to have the zoning officer issue a enforcement violation and have that scheduled for the zoning hearing board. Um, the zoning hearing board wouldn't be able to enforce a council order. Yet. So uh, hopefully that's a long answer. I'm just no, 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 I get it. It's just, it's just as odd to put um, enforcement in the executive branch. Well, there's, I mean, this is. Well, there's not, I mean, any, there are conditional use provisions throughout the zoning code now. And if, I mean, for example, the, the residential uh, buildings that were built in the facilities uh, were done by conditional use, had they violated those conditional use provisions, this council could immediately file an action uh, to stop them from doing what they were, are doing. Um, I, I don't know if <laughs> I would classify council as the, the executive branch. It's more of a legislative body. Okay. But certainly not the ones that usually enforce them. I mean, you know, there's a fire inspector; he usually enforces. And they and they're still there. I mean, yeah, for, I know. For the safety, for the, the building inspector, still going to be doing their work, but just for the special conditions that make these buildings unique. The uniqueness is what's tied to the conditional use decisions to make to make sure they stay. Any other questions? In the instance where there were fish um, conditions at the Methodist Church that didn't appear to fit, um, it was the Planning Commission that brought those to the Council's attention, and then there was an administrative action taken by the office to, uh, to request that they fix them. So, well, that makes sense. Kimberly yeah. really Bizak, 237 Dudley. I just wanted to clarify from what I was hearing tonight that there's, with the parking issue and south, the south Narbert side seeming to have, to not have a lot of available parking, with the Elmwood project, there's nothing that would prohibit council from recommending um, or mandating that the owner would provide employees with parking on the north side or recommend that the owner would work out a deal for a contract in like a municipal or a private lot for the employees to park. That way the south side wouldn't be absorbing the parking necessarily. <coughs> it could, you could look to the north side if council. Uh, if, if it was reasonable, if it was reasonable to say, hey, employees, you need to walk this far to go to work and there's space here. Uh, what is reasonable? I mean, that's how far do you walk to the bus or to the train? I mean, that, that, that's what the decision would be. Getting into private parking agreements, that would be something I think that the, the applicant would try to 
if they felt that they needed to do that, present council with that as an option, and then that would be something that would be made as a conditional use that this, this would be entered. But the ordinance only addresses, I think, off street parking, and um, they would have to be reasonable. Uh, the, the language is it's not going to be like you could have now. Did the Methodist Church? They have enough parking spaces in their underground parking for all their people, all the units there. Yeah. Well, then why can't the Baptist Church do the state and make a dedicated parking garage? We don't know details really about that. Right? Because that whole I know, but I'm just saying that sounds like as this nice lady in green say. I mean, that's that sounds like an easy answer is just to have them build their own parking structure. There's that whole basement of that where the bowling alley is in that church. You know, make that into the parking structure. Thank you. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet who would like to speak? <coughs> Robin Newcomer, Grove Place. In addition to parking, per se, place to put your vehicle, there's also the fact that the streets are so narrow that lots of times when I just drive down to, to, go, out, to, to go out somewhere, I have to pull over into an empty parking place so somebody can come down the street and get past yeah, me. Right. There's an awful lot of that going on right now. That's if right. all the parking places are actually parked in, I don't know where you're going to go with your car when you meet another car coming your direction. It's, it's really very narrow. I see it all the time. When you literally could be back. If there's a a postal vehicle or a delivery, yeah, right, I have right, to right. back down the street and go out some other way right now. Mm -hmm. And this is trash. Yeah, that's just yeah. bad, yeah. Who else? Anybody else? You can't get out the uh, The sister is just, uh, quick general. Um, one, I wondered, is the making of it. I'm oh, sorry, Jennifer Lammer, Windsor Avenue, 119. Um, is the making of the parking spaces available at the church space uh, within the impervious pervious percentages? And is that something that's been considered? And um, uh, in general, I know this topic uh, for this meeting is about M1 Avenue event. Will you be talking about general zoning issues at further meetings? I'm seeing houses being constructed and seem to have no setbacks, and there seems to be um, a lot of activity going on right now, having huge impact on what is already a very dense little town. And I wondered if you were going to be addressing general zoning. Well, you know, we should do so we should restate our, just the, the emphasis of our conversation the other day in the gallery is that we <coughs> should ask ourselves as a committee to to re-ask the solicitor to look into solutions that we could have along those lines as far as an hour time or any delay issue. Because it's, the bottom line is we'd like to see uh, something that at least delay these things so that people can digest them, be aware of them. And that was one of the thought processes as we had our gathering the other day. And I think maybe we should restate, the, ask our solicitor as a committee, if the committee agrees, for ideas and possible legal means to Make sure that uh, I'm talking about delayed demolition. Delayed, delayed demolition, demolition and make people and aware of demolition. Public notice. Uh, the idea of the constraints of the law. And even the idea of the, other, the idea that came up the other day was of a designated permit for tear down. Mm -hmm. So that if you were to build something, you would be required two permits: one to tear down and the second permit to build, so that the tear down permit would have a well, waiting period attached to it or some kind of conditions, specific, special conditions. I mean, I, I, no, I mean, I, 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 I have some general thoughts on, uh, first, I believe there are demolition permits that, that are applied for usually at the same time as construction permits. It's my understanding that the office will be alerting public when demolition permits, uh, maybe even construction permits, Sean, I'm not sure, are being, being requested. Um, that's, that's something that's not mandated. That's something the office is doing as a courtesy in response to the concerns that the council and the office is hearing regarding this. So hopefully the notification issue will be solved in, in the short term. As far as um, 
delaying what we can delay, we're going to have to think outside of the box. Uh, if it's any sort of more war in Montero, that's, that's something that, that can be done. Generally, it wouldn't, it, it could not be done. Uh, this is something that's, that is, uh, comes under the, the UCC, uh, the, the construction code. If you don't issue a permit within 15 days for a residential, one or two, two residential building, it's automatically granted. Uh, and our code has that 15 day requirement. Now, whether there's something that couldn't be done, uh, after that 15 day period for matters of public safety, possibly, but at that sense may be delaying it for 10 days, 15 days before something's torn down. And is that something that is really helpful uh, to just delay what, what could happen? Um, so I will look into to seeing if there's a long term fix. But I think thinking about this a lot, the issue really isn't as much as the, the teardowns, is what's being built in their place. And uh, under the new form zoning code, you can still tear down buildings. But the issue is, does it prevent you from building the type of buildings that people are objecting to in the future? So, so in that aspect, it comes back to what's being built and the form zoning code. Um, there are more things about that we even talked about back in June when you were really concerned that the house was torn down before everything started happening. We talked about uh, maybe just getting the form zoning code passed and, and coming back and making fixes later. There's obviously downsides and upsides to that, but that's something that could be considered uh, by this council uh, that I think has more understanding, uh, more support for it. But obviously, there are downsides. That as well, uh, but I will look into that uh, to see if there's there's something that uh, just not that can be done, but is legal. Uh, <laughs> this is this is the kind of aspect when you're dealing with someone purchasing a property for a lot of money and wanting to make a lot of money off of it that they're really willing to spend a lot of money to sue the township to make sure it goes forward. So we want to make sure whatever we do is legal or at least has a good legal argument that it's something new. Yeah, this may be a good moment to. Give the floor to Mayor Grady for a, just a public service announcement. I don't want to ask, we're yeah. having a tech town hall on December 8th at 7 o'clock over the big auditorium. I'd like to hear your comments about what kind of town do you think Narvis should be? Do you think Narvis should be all residential on the south side? Do you think it should be all commercial on the north side? There are topics which we're going to have a chance to talk about and what your reasons are for them. Uh, we're going to talk about demolitions, we're going to talk about teardowns, uh, we're going to talk about this ordinance as well as future ordinances going. But I'm trying to find an idea about what kind of town you want to live in. What's important to you? What makes the ideal neighborhood? The council members, I trust, will be there, and the developers will be there, and a large group of people will be there to talk about it. And so you have more of an opportunity. It's more informal. You know, you're on the clock with me in terms of what you're to talk and get other group discussion over it. And I welcome everyone again on December 8th. Seven o'clock. We'll just for the evening, can we just take a few more? Can I just answer her second? Her first part of that question was as far as impervious coverage goes. Uh, requirements are still necessary for impervious coverage. There is a, a provision in here that if you could provide enough recharge for the direct water runoff generated by the 100 year storm, uh, that, that there could be impervious uh, uh, changes to that. Uh, which, quite frankly, the County Planning Commission thought was a little too high of a standard uh, to meet, but obviously we want to make sure they can meet high levels of water runoff. But generally, uh, no, the, the idea is you know, we need proper buffering. Uh, they need all the requirements uh, that would otherwise be required under the code for, for any parking. So they can't just fit additional parking spaces throughout to try to meet this if it, if it doesn't meet the code. And frankly, some of the new building that's going on that it has nothing to do with teardowns, um, there seems to be very minimal setback in many of the new structures that have been built. The property is quite small, and yet the house seems to go pretty much edge to edge. I thought we had setback, so I don't know. We got that new zoning map. Is that a zoning plan? We're still waiting to get enacted. Mm -hmm. So All our new construction has been compliant with zoning code. With the, with with the, the existing, current, with the existing current, current, not existing. the new one. So that means we really need this 
news I mean, hopefully to reduce the size, I mean, in my thinking, reduce the size of the structures that are going up on these properties like crazy because Narbeth is already so dense and all of the new constructions look enormously out of scale to our community. So, yeah. We're looking at more density. Sorry. <laughs> you said it's so dense, but yes. we're looking at more density. Well, well that's why. Why are we looking for that? <laughs> that's not true. I, uh, I, yes. Yeah. That's but, that's may I, can I suggest something? And Bob, you and I talked about this. Um, that every month you, you, you uh, read the statement of how many permits have been uh, given at our monthly meeting, the caucus meeting, or the general meeting, and you state how much uh, income. Would it be possible to break those permits down to the point we hear that there are 10 permits issued for new construction, 10 permits issued for anything? I think in the future, Is there a possibility in the coming year, Sean? I think those will be categorized in different ways according to what type of no. permit they are. So yeah, they might well be in a database of fields and right. sort them in different ways. Okay. So, but I want to get them. was all done by hand. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I want to get a map out in the first quarter of 2016. Here I am making promises from the first quarter of 2016 where you, can, where you can map and click on parcels and see the activity. It's really easy to do. Yeah, I think the bottom line is that we hope to make all of this information public and available really easily. You wouldn't even have to come into the grow office to see it. You could access it online, and that's, that's, that's our goal in the near term. In the long term, that information, the presentation of that information becomes more sophisticated. So you can really get that information visually and as well as numerically. And, and I, I should say too, Bob, that if council wanted to, they could direct the office, we don't need an ordinance, we don't need a resolution, to just say, hey, if there is a demolition permit, we want you to send flyers out to everyone within 500 feet of that resolution. But that's something that could be worked so within, within the office. The oh, without even a, we don't even have a motion at council. No, no, it's just so, something. Just, so I think that the building zoning committee would like to see that done. Beginning as soon as possible. Yes. Yeah. That's easy. Yeah. Um, you know, there, anyone who hasn't spoken yet, can I just see the yes. hands of how many more we have? Because we, let's take these last four. I see four hands. and. Um, and then, and then we'll call the meeting adjourned. Um, yes, Rosemary. Rosemary McDonough, and I am with Abby. Um, there's just a, a point of clarification I want to ask that I think would um, serve perhaps to um, help some of the malice we have in our, our neighborhood. Uh, there seems to be uh, a general feeling among some members of Borough Council, of the Planning Committee, of the Planning Commission, that um, increased density is in and of itself a, a good thing, that uh, mixed use, residential, commercial, is inherently a good thing. This seems to me to be flying in the face of what the residents say. I'd love to just poll you quickly to see, do you, do you agree with that, that more density and more mixed use is inherently good, and if so, why? No. I think this is something that we're trying to hear. I mean, obviously, we, we've got the petition. Uh, we, we recognize, and I'm, I don't want to speak for the council, but the council recognizes that there are many residences out there that just don't want an office use. Um, and we can still have an office use on this. But if the concern is more parking, that's something that we, we can't do. Um, you don't have full council here. They're still developing the issues. They still need to get recommendations from the Planning Commission. It's, the, the Planning Commission is appointed to give council feedback on these certain issues about what's good and what's bad, and they make up their own mind. Their, uh, uh, their, their job is to make recommendations. Um, so I think that council's not in a position right now to make, make that decision. So we hear more about whether people are against mixed use in general. Okay, whether, but, whether but I it think would the work vibe the is that, that you know, the residents are going one way and the leadership is going another. And I think it would make a lot of people sleep better just to have a sense that, no, we don't necessarily think increased density is, is good or we don't necessarily think mixed use is good. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have the feeling that we're on the same page as you. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, and then Dave, that's 
Well, they were, they were four hands initially, yeah. and then I saw Dave Berto's hand up. So. Yeah. Real quick, Dave Berto, 104 Chestnut Avenue. I mean, a lot of people talk about the parking, and that's certainly an issue. Uh, my main concern, though, is a safety standpoint of view from what I see with the cars driving up and down the street right now. Uh, walking back and forth from the train station, I see cars continually going through stop signs in the south side of Narbor, and you're adding more volume, more cars. It's a safety issue for me. So sure, I mean, I'd like the idea of parking in front of my house, um, but it's it's becoming more and more of an issue, you know, even the point where my, you know, my car was either, I had another hit and run on Sunday night. I mean, my car's been hit and run two times now on the south side of Narbor. I've lost two mirrors. Um, you know, it's just, it's constant. It's just, you're just adding, adding more volume, and it's a safety concern. Thank you. Terry? Yes, Terry Fox, 104 Maple Avenue. I have um, four questions, and I don't want my, I am res for residential only, and I don't want my questions about the ordinance to be interpreted as I am in favor of mixed use. That being said, um, under the definition of office use, I think that it's still very vague when you have um, terms like of similar character. And I also noticed that there were certain types of office use that was allowed under the form based zoning code, like funeral homes, stores, small restaurant, and bed and breakfast, that's not included here. So I don't think that this ordinance does a good job of really tightening up office use. And I think it has to limit um, more specifically, you know, eliminate many kind of uses and also put a head count on it. And that would be really important. The second question I have is on page 4F. It says parking spaces used to reduce an existing nonconformity may be permitted in the front yard. Um, there's all this talk about wanting to do the form based zoning code so we don't have front yard garages or cars parking in the front yard. So I'm wondering why you would allow then front yard parking on the church. This corner is important to us. There should not be any parking allowed on that grass property at all. I mean, the church is, everybody's saying, let's <coughs> keep the church. It's a beautiful building. It's not going to be a beautiful building if you're tearing up the grass and you're putting 11 parking spaces there. So I don't feel that there should be any parking allowed on that church property at all. And again, I'm for residential only. I don't know what I'd like to understand on page 5C. It says under extension or expansion. Um, that just sounds like it allows for additions onto this church property, and I'm not clear about that. I, I could comment on that. Actually, that's, that's in there already. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that they couldn't take advantage of the mixed use aspect to, to apply that, which is why we amended it to say except to set forth above under subsection B. So what, can you explain that to me? What does that mean in terms of the building is there, it has a footprint, it's existing. So does, does this allow for any additions onto this at all? But it's, it refers to the use specifically. Um, that the use may be expanded or extended. Um, I'd have to look at the ordinance completely as well. I mean, this is an ordinance that's A through F. Uh, and where the, the ordinance itself only addresses the areas that it's changing. Uh, but my initial review is that it's interpreted as the non use and the expansion of the use. Um, so if this was a situation under the old ordinance where you had uh, you know, part of the building being used as the traditional uh, institutional use building, and part of that building was being used as residential units. Uh, once you received the approval for the residential units, you could expand that use, a non-conforming use for residential units, uh, into the rest of the area but not more than 25% of the area devoted. Obviously, we didn't want to expand commercial or office use, I should say. So we specifically put that language in there that says except as set forth under subsection B. So this is, this is used, this is a provision there to try to keep uh, restraints on future development in that property. So 
So if but your question is, are you able to expand and add on to the building yes. itself? Mm -hmm. That that would be a non-conforming structure, as, as opposed to non-conforming use. And then they would have they would have to, uh, quite frankly, they probably wouldn't be allowed to do that because they'd be changing the facade of the building under those conditions. And going uh, back to the use, then, so it would be possible to go back to 100% residential if it, if there was non-conforming use. Yes. But you would not be able to. Um, increase that 50% commercial? That's correct. Okay. And then um, I would just like some kind of verbal acknowledgement from the planning commission, the committee, that you have heard that the majority of the residents in South Marber are opposed to commercial, that they want residential only, and that there is another developer who has put in a bid to do, just like a Methodist church, she would do condos in the church here. And I would just like a verbal acknowledgement of that. If we can listen to the pews of a church and how much parking would that allow, I think it seems only polite that we should be able to hear a recognition of our petitions and the recognition of the fact that there is another developer who's willing to put um, condos in there like she did very successfully with the Methodist. So, can somebody just, you could have stated facts about that. Yeah, it, it, uh, clearly, council has received the petition uh, mm -hmm. and the signatures on the petition made a of record. Um, and uh, that was set forth in detail at the full council meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, they've heard that. And that the fact that there are these additional changes to the ordinance, uh, I think, shows that council heard the outcries before regarding the parking issues and the limiting to the office. The council is now hearing more that this is regarding the use issues. Um, as far as the developer, um, I'm not sure if council I mean, knows anything about that or has been able to verify that or not. If that's something that you would like to present to council uh, more substantively, I think you're, you'd be welcome to do that. I do believe that that has been spoken up at several meetings and some council members and the planning commission, I know Jim Cornwell has talked with the developer. But I thank you for saying that so that this ordinance is the one that you worked up after you heard parking concerns, but that you haven't really gone back to the drawing board now that you've heard about all the petitions because that's like changing the conversation. Well, I, 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 I think that the issue is you know, what council will have to decide if, they're, if they want to vote to approve this is mm -hmm. You know, whether they want to have the office use in that building or not. At the end of the day, that's the decision that's going to have to be made. Um, but if there's anything that can be done, I think the, this ordinance shows that council's listening, taking feedback uh, from before, and trying to to meet you know, the uh, requests of council borough. The borough. Thank you, John. That's there was uh, there were two more hands. There's one more. One back. There. Hi, Karen Oreza, uh, 247 Hampton. Sean, I was happy to hear you say that all the setbacks were to code. Are all the footprints for garages in the town, that type of new construction, are those to code as well? I'm sorry, say that again? You know how you said all the new construction that's being done is to code in terms yeah. of the setbacks? Is ever, all the new construction that's going on right now to code in terms of the size of the garages? Yes. So I put out the zoning ordinance the other day. It, it's hard for me to understand, but it looked like when it talks about garages that they should be 660 square feet. Is that correct? That's actually under the building code that you're referring to, not the zoning code. And the building code was replaced by the UCC, I believe, in 2004. And that's what the inspections have been operating. What was the, on the Narberth Borough website, it was the zoning ordinance that I pulled out. It was not the building code. And I actually called Bruce L. Cohen, who's over at Montgomery County Planning. You guys probably know him. And he told me uh, that there's a real process that all towns have to go through. If someone has to have a variance to 660 square feet. But the way I read it to him, it was a zoning, not a building. He said that zoning is very different than 
the UCC that one is for right. the footprint right. and the other is for the actual structure. If, if you refer so to the zoning code, I, I, it is the zoning I code. That it wasn't the construction code. So I, I know that the definition. I think I, I can probably pull it up, but I can show it to you after. But, the but meeting. I know that the definition under the construction code. This is not the construction code. Private garages limiting to two garages and 660 square feet, and that's what was replaced by the UCC. So is that garage 660 square feet? No. So is it to, so is it being that legally code, built? That or? provision you're speaking of is chapter is in chapter 50, not 124, and all the contents of chapter 50 were superseded in 2004 when the borough adopted, uh, chose to opt in to enforcing this the PAU Universal Construction Code. You wouldn't know that by downloading the PDF on our website because the text is still in the code and it should have been taken out and there should have been something in there that said this has been repealed by so that this kind of confusion wouldn't have propagated, but that's that's what happened. So what is this? If I come to you and I want to buy a, I want to build a garage, can, what can a, what's legal for me to do? Then how will my neighbor know? How many square feet? Like, what can I do? What can I build? Specific to your lot. So he'd have to. You'd have to. This is this is not a fair question because there are lots of you can't. It's a side by side purpose, whether it's a side by a corner lot, setbacks, square footage. If you're going to come in and you're going to build a garage, you would have to comply both with the zoning code requirements, which discuss you know setbacks. And right square footage, but also the building code requirements, which is the, the uniform construction code, which is what Yerkes Engineers goes out and makes sure that it's being built in conformance with the UCC code. So those are the two things that need to be done in order to, to build a garage. If what you're building is not in line with the zoning code, yes, you would have to seek a variance uh, and explain to the zoning hearing board, not this council, why you should be entitled to that variance. And you need to have a hardship in order to primarily to get that variance. But I, council, and this metric is not a position where you can just speak broadly over every provision that would be in the code. So that homeowner did not need a variance. They're, you're, what you're saying, it sounds like, is that his are you, property. Are you referring to uh, the corner of uh, what is it, Price and Essex? Price and Essex. Price and, I, uh, it's to, the to, planning uh, commissioner, guys. Sure, that a couple guy's things house. with that. Um, council has addressed that previously. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there have been uh, legal uh, assertions made against council about pursuing legal actions against council in that matter that have uh, yet to be resolved. So I would have to advise council, uh, Mr. Metric, to not give details to that uh, because of that ongoing. Uh, legal accusations that are made against counsel be used against them in that matter. Um, but I think it's fair to say that, uh, that, that there was an application for that garage uh, submitted to Mr. Martin, who was the zoning officer at the time. He reviewed the plans, and he believed that the plans were in agreement with the zoning code. Uh, granted the permits for the garage based upon his interpretation, which is the zoning officer's job to interpret the code and the projects. And then it was then inspected by Yerkes to make sure that it was being built in accordance with the UCC, and it was also being built in accordance with the UCC. Um, I think it's also safe to say that council hears that uh, residents don't like the current zoning code and what you're able to, to do under the current zoning code, which is why, again, it comes back to need for the form-based code, and maybe some of those changes could be regulated. So we I saw one more hand, Michelle. I just want to say, really, I know what everyone wants to leave. Um, okay. Michelle Pananopoulos, 125 Marion Avenue. And I just feel like I should speak up because so many people on the south side where I live have spoken against mixed use or any, any kind of office or any kind of increase in density. And I actually signed a petition because the petitioners informed me that 